I see a lot of familiar faces, mostly familiar faces. So hopefully this isn't too mundane for you, but uh, my name is Matt White. I am the executive director of the PyTorch Foundation and GM of AI at the Linux Foundation. Um, and working with this wonderful group of folks at the Generative AI Commons. So, in case you're not totally aware of what's happening in AI these days, uh, everything is open. Um, open source, open science, open access, and even I've heard some talk about open relationships. <laughs> but what is open, right? Um, and so I do recognize that uh, these box lunches they serve are pretty much full of sedatives. And so there's a few folks here that are probably just ready to pass out. Uh, so we'll take some time here to play a little game called uh, Is It Open? So I'm going to reveal an image. And you're going to say whether it's open by saying yes or no. So let's try this one. Is it open? All right. How about this one? Okay. How about now? Mm. Getting harder, huh? How about that one? All right, all right. <laughs> so I think what we're experiencing here is a little bit what's being experienced in, in the industry, right, around AI, which is that there are some competing versions and definitions of what is is open, right? Um, and so, like any right-minded person uh, who loves legacy search, I thought I would look up open myself and look up open AI and hit Google, right? And so Google can't tell me anything that's not right. So I found these guys. They're legit, right? They, they, they might know what open is. Um, so we've got some challenges, right? Uh, and they don't seem to be getting much clearer. Um, there are a rapidly growing number of models being published to sites like Hugging Face, to GitHub, Kaggle, even apparently Torrents, right? Um, several thousand models a day, mostly fine-tuned models, are, are appearing. Uh, there is a lot of open washing, so open source AI, open models, open this, open that. Um, it has become a very good uh, marketing buzzword. Um, some of these uh, models are being released with licenses that have downstream restrictions, right? And so that isn't really consistent with the spirit of openness. Uh, there's also a lack of understanding of what license implications are for both those publishing models, fine tuning them, and using them in practicum. Uh, many companies or sorry, many of the components are not being released as well. So we see model architecture and model weights, but we don't see a whole lot more than that. Uh, something that's kind of happening a lot on, uh, on Hugging Face now is that folks are taking Llama 2, which is a restrictive license, fine-tuning it, and then re-releasing it as Apache 2.0, right? And unfortunately, you cannot do that by the terms of the license that you agreed to. So that creates a lot of uh, mystery for, for folks on the downstream, especially when there's a challenge with model lineage and deriving where you're, what's actually the foundation model behind this, right? Like, is this Llama 2? Is it mixed role? Who knows? Um, and then open source licenses are being, which were always designed for software and some were also designed for documentation, are being used for non-software components, right? And it's not... It's not implicit that model weights would be covered by an open source software license. Uh, also, AUPs, user agreements, click-throughs, these are all like in the way of you getting a hold of weights, right? And so there's real no transfer of rights when you go and pull down these weights. Um, and effectively, the developer still retains that. So there's a few concepts here that I would wouldn't mind touching uh, on short or quickly. Um, there's certainly, uh, what we're seeing is really like two kind of worlds converging, right? Open source and like AI research, right? And academic research. And so there's concepts to be 
borrowed from both. Uh, open science is a long-standing concept, right? And, and it's really built upon like open access, open data, open source, and then the concepts of open peer reviews and open collaboration. And so the whole purpose of open science is to make research available for the public, right? And full transparency, here are all the, all the uh, building blocks of the research, here's all the, the documentation behind it, and you know, here's an opportunity for you to review the work we've done and provide feedback or improve upon it. And you know, science is, is very iterative, right? And so uh, improvements are you know, made upon prior work, as, as is the case with the, the transformer architecture, which powers today's language models. So I don't think I need to explain this to most of you, um, but you know, fundamentally, open source is really about not just transparency, but really the free distribution of software code and you know, building communities, collaborating, working together to improve on prior work. But also, there's a big part of this, which is licensing, right? Which is, what can I do with the software that I have access to? Um, and I'll touch a little bit more on that uh, in further slides. So the OSI you know, uh, is working on a definition of open source AI. Um, the working term that we've been using here is open AI and you know, open with a space. Uh, it's not a great term just because of its misappropriation, but uh, it is just very descriptive. Um, and most of today's you know, open source models are actually source available, right? Like we talk about open source software and source available as uh, employing a more restrictive license. Well, the same as can be said about models, right? Is that they employ a restrictive license and they don't meet the definition of open. So we also have open data here, right? And, and you know, this is certainly a, a challenge um, due to the nature of copyright laws, right? And the availability of, of data is, is always beneficial for, to the community. Uh, being able to redistribute that data in a machine readable format that doesn't require a lot of um, you know, uh, parsing and, and uh, reformatting, but also like completeness in the data, right? Like what all what data has been used in this research? Um, and so I'm still speaking a little abstractly because I'm following the kind of the research methodology here. But in the model development lifecycle, this would be your you know training data. It would also be any fine tuning data and any alignment data uh, for things like reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, and so, you know, the biggest challenge today is that uh, there's a lack of transparency in data sets, but there's really a lack of access to those data sets, right? To be able to go and, you know, reproduce what work has been done already and to improve upon that to, you know, create, uh, you know, higher performing models and to experiment and to trace bias and other factors in the data. So open content. So open content is very similar to open data. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, we have to treat unstructured data differently than, than data, and it has uh, its own set of licenses, you know, most notably like Creative Commons licenses. Um, and the challenge is, again, is that most of this data is copyrighted, right? And, uh, you know, but open content license are very, is very appropriate for documentation um, in distributions. And then... Lastly here, like open access, right? So this is like being able to access research, like you know, technical reports, any, any publications that are accompanying your research. And one thing that is being said a lot lately, which is just driving me nuts, is that people are saying open access models, open access weights or model weights. And that's not in try, you know, like it's a bit of a misnomer and open access is really you know geared toward things like you know an example is archive right like being able to go and download uh, research papers without a paywall. So back to, to what is OpenAI right? Um, so what is what is open in AI really? Is it is it the model and like the set of learned parameters, uh, and or is it that those two things are widely available for download? Uh, is it you know, providing other artifacts involved in the model development lifecycle, like training data sets and inference code and other, other aspects. 
Uh, also, is it the open licenses used for the components, right? Um, does that constitute openness? So we have these two concepts of like completeness and openness, and I think this will help reframe. So openness is kind of being explained as like anything from a spectrum to like, you know, discontiguous vectors to all kinds of like different concepts um, to the point where I can say something's open and you have no idea what that means, right? And so to try and remedy this, we've kind of um, disentangled openness from the concept of completeness. So completeness is basically providing all of these different components that are involved in, in your research or in the development of a you know, large language model. Um, and so the more components you release, the more complete your work is. Openness, we've distilled down to being this you know, binary. Is it open or is it not open? Because that will give the consumer a lot more idea of, okay, you know, what am I getting here when I, when I use a model? Um, and so an open license is, is really what will help you understand whether something is open or not. So to give a sort of like very easy way to remember this, we've got this small acronym here. Uh, so we borrow from the concept of freedoms, right, in, in open source. So the ability, ability to use, modify, distribute for any purpose, including commercial usage. Then we have accessibility. So this is like the open access. You can download whatever you need. Uh, you know, collaboration and community. This encourages input, transparency, contributions into uh, the collective good. And then obviously transparency on itself is the you know, ability to have these artifacts available and scrutinize them and um, provide you know, input on, okay, you know, red teaming and other things that uh, can help improve upon a model. But ultimately, these are enforced through, through open licenses. So you know, pre-AI era software licensing, we have you know, software documentation and potentially some libraries and tools. Um, you know, this is sort of began in the 60s when software was disentangled from hardware. And, and it was fairly straightforward, right? But then in the AI era, we have like everything. We don't just have two forms of media now. We have data, which is a huge factor in all of this, right? And then we have content, um, which is sort of that, uh, you know, images and videos and other forms of media. So just a quick look, like to look at what is open and what's proprietary and restrictive licenses in the language model space. Um, you know, Apache 2.0, great license. Uh, you know, Eleuther AI has used it for Pythia. Google's used it for Gemma's model architecture, but not for its weights. And we've got MIT. Uh, we've got, you know, CC by SA 4.0, which is probably not a great license for, for a model, um, but Stability has used that. Uh, and then on the proprietary and restrictive side, you know, Llama 2 employs its own license, DBRX employs its own license, TII um, for the Falcon models employ their own license. And then you know, a lot of these licenses are well-intentioned, right? Like limit some downstream usage, don't do something that's illegal, but it creates a lot of uh, uncertainty, which sort of limits its ability to be adopted more broadly and, and especially for the enterprise, right? So. We talk about what's illegal, uh, don't, you know, don't break the law, but like what law and what country, and is that a just law? Like we start to get into a space where we just don't want to hang out. So, you know, what's the solution to all of this, right? Um, so we, at the Generative AI Commons and LFAI and Data sat down, uh, we started working on this last summer and uh, it's a collaboration, but the ultimate you know, product of this you know, ended up in a paper, but it's actually the cumulative work of a, a, a large number of people. Um, and so on the paper side, you know, we collaborated with uh, you know, Columbia University and the University of Oxford to, to put out this work. Um, it is the first work product from the Generative AI Commons. Uh, so we basically took all of the components that are in the model development lifecycle and broke them down into separate components that can be released 
on their own or together, um, but predicated on their function in the entire model development life cycle, being able to re be able to um, sort of increase like reproducibility and transparency in model development. And so we have 16 artifacts here. Uh, most of them, you know, you've heard of model weights and model parameters, or sorry, model parameters, which are the weights, sorry, uh, model architecture. But then we've, you know, in, encouraging model cards and data cards and other aspects here. So this, this is kind of the starting point where we're at with acceptable licenses, right? We really wanted to push folks towards using more permissive licensing as opposed to um, you know, strictly copy left or uh, any, any other form of restrictive licensing. So we've got all these, these components in here. Uh, we basically took, you know, divided them into domains, right? Is this model centric or is it data centric? Uh, it just happens that you know, technical reports and research paper are both, and so they overlap. But then we needed to move down to content types because each license should have, uh, sorry, each component should have a like medium specific license or medium appropriate license. Um, so one of the challenges here is, uh, as I alluded to earlier, which was, you know, model weights, they're, you know, released under Apache 2.0, it's implied that the model parameters are released. So if we look at something like Mixtral, Apache 2.0 covers the model um, architecture, which is in code, but the model weights themselves, it's unknown, right? It's, it's un untested. Um, the nightmare scenario is that somebody releases a, an open source model, you think that you're getting the weights as a part of that deal, and then you know, six months later, you get a cease and desist letter that says, hey, we released this as Apache 2.0. There's nothing in Apache 2.0 that says it covers model weights. And so, you know, again, all this is very like untested ground and um, you know, attorneys aren't really thrilled when they hear that there's these sort of uh, you know, got you type scenarios. So what we did with all these components is we then broke them down into classes, right? And so the at the core of the, the MOF is these, you know, three tiers, or sorry, three classes to be able to differentiate what is um, provided to uh, model consumers. And so class three, open model, this is what you're seeing most for the most part today. So like a model architect, the model architecture, and then the model parameters and a final set of weights with the uh, optimizer state. And that's what, that's really all you need to be able to do some experimentation, even to build a product around, as long as it is um, using OSI approved licenses for the, the architecture. Uh, the technical report, we're you know encouraging folks to provide uh, stronger technical reports. Uh, a lot of them have been fairly weak lately. Uh, evaluation results, so yeah, you know, claim that you, you know, score X and X on MLU compared to whoever else, but realistically, um, you know, we want to be able to have that information so that people can make an informed decision about whether they want to use your model. And then we have model cards and data cards, right? So describing the model, describing the data. So class two is sort of this like middle ground, right? So this is where we get a little bit more in terms of transparency and reproducibility. We know what libraries were used. We have access to those libraries. We have evaluation data um, and evaluation code. And the reason why there's two separate things here is one is code is covered by certain licenses and data by another set of license, right? But large language models are evaluated against open data. Um, on the inference side, you may be using evaluation code to do like you know, ML, ML per for some sort of benchmark. So that's why they're separated here. We also have the training code and inference code. And so that will help you reproduce the type of performance that they're making claims about the model producer, sorry. And then we have got class one open science. So this is like, you know, the place, um, sorry, the tier to reach for, right? What to strive for. You know, this is giving everything, right? A really complete research paper, all of the data sets, the data pre-processing code, all the model parameters and metadata. And then, you know, there's 
there are a few groups that have kind of gone into this space now, which are like releasing intermediate checkpoints so that you can actually resume training at different stages. Or you can observe how the model has trained progressively over time. Um, and, th and that provides like, you know, the highest amount of transparency into the, uh, the training process. Um, one thing to note here is that all of these components are expected to have open licenses. Now, we recognize that data sets can't really do that so much, right? Uh, these you know, training data sets are uh, like fine-tuned data sets, you know, perhaps, right, human-generated or machine-generated. But on the you know, open content side, not so much. And so the understanding here is that uh, there is an exception for data sets. So how, how would we implement this, right? Um, and so what we came up with was creating this index file, which is called a MOF JSON file. And it's an index file that has all the details about the model under spec, as well as points to all the paths for all of the different model components that are included, and the path to the license file for that particular component, so that it's well understood what you're getting when you download a particular package. And so we have this model openness tool that's currently under development. Uh, it's web-based, and so basically model producers will go to the website, they'll submit their model, select the component, select what license they're releasing under, and it will give them a classification. And what that ends up doing is giving them back a, a copy of the moff.json file, which they drop into their uh, GitHub repo, and then issues a badge. So that's, that, this is like, we borrow this from OpenSSF, right? The best, class, uh, the best practice is badges. And basically you get this markdown uh, text that you drop into your readme file. Um, and then it gets recorded to the model openness scoreboard. So what are the benefits to model producers, right? Like why would anybody be incentivized to, to participate in this? Um, really by you know, creating models that are open and free of restrictions, there's a better opportunity to create a more vibrant ecosystem around those models. Uh, you know, folks are more likely to adopt them, especially in the enterprise, and more innovation is gonna happen around those, right? Uh, People can take those models, build a startup on them, build a business, and adopt it for their business quite safely. Uh, the, other, the other great thing is, is that you can improve the model itself, right, and, and subsequent iterations. You get a lot of human feedback from the community. You can go and look at some of the innovations that are being done in the community to improve the data set, to improve model performance, and ultimately come out with a better product. Uh, this also has the net effect of appeasing regulators, right? Every, their regulators are looking at um, openness in models right now with, with high scrutiny. Uh, there are a number of government initiatives in the U.S., right? NTIA and, and NIST, uh, to name a couple. Um, and so, you know, moving towards more transparency and reproducibility sort of appeases uh, regulators. And then you can improve the safety and security of models, right? More red teaming can happen. People can actually, the community actually can take a lot of this work off your hands by going back and saying, okay, well, here's in your data set is where we've traced this bias in the model back to, right? Um, and you can continually uh, iterate and improve upon it. So the, the, the MOF effect here is to move model producers towards releasing more components and releasing those components with open licenses. That is you know, distilling it right down to the function, that is all we're trying to do here. Uh, and then there's a benefit to the model consumers, right? So clarity on what they're getting. You know, what can I do with this? Where did this come from, right? What model, what foundation model is this model based on, this fine-tuned model based on? Uh, and there's no limitation on what, what you can do with it, right? You can use it for commercial purposes, but you can use it for research, education, and innovation, whereas today, a lot of models you can only use for research. Um, and then, you know, enhance the model for your own purposes, right? You don't necessarily, in the spirit of like permissive licensing, you can go and improve upon the model and have this great domain specific model for your organization and train it on your own, your own data. You don't necessarily need to dump all that data back into the community, right? That, that, that's the, the, you know, the purpose of permissive licensing. 
um, and you know, collaborate with a broader community, right? Being able to reach out to others and see what ex experiences they had with the model and being able to uh, get higher performance out of it. Um, and then, of course, like the reproducibility piece, getting all access to all these other components and being able to improve collectively on uh, the model ecosystem. So for, for users, the, the effect of the MOF is really to make it clear what model, sorry, which models are actually open and what's included with those models. And that's really, you know, as far as we go. So there's a few things that are, were out of scope with the model openness framework, right? We wanted to achieve those two outcomes, right? Being able to get more components into open licenses and inform the public about what they're getting and what they can use it for. So out of scope for the model openness framework were things like bias and fairness, right? There are more than a handful of organizations that are you know, playing in this space and legislators and you know, partnerships and everything, right? So the, the assumption is that they can handle this in another layer of the stack. Uh, AI safety, again, along that same lines, there are other initiatives in, in, in the process, in the industry. Model and code reviews, we weren't going to go in through and audit people's models and code uh, work. The expectation is that this is an honor system. You're going to submit what licenses you have. Those are verifiable in GitHub. Um, there's not really any way for you to go around that. Um, and trustworthiness, again, we believe that creating transparency and openness will lead to trustworthiness, but it's not a direct um, item that we're attacking. And then, you know, performance testing, right? Yeah, make all kinds of claims that you can score this on like human eval. We're not here to try and, you know, validate those claims. Um, red teaming, other sort of security and privacy, uh, you know, frameworks can handle that. And then anything that's like, you know, Ill the anything that would be illegal should be handled by the proper authorities, right? We're not here to tell you what you can and can't do for with your models. So there's a call to action here. Um, the model openness framework is a work in progress, right? This is something that is out in the community. Uh, it is open for comment. Uh, we're going to keep the comments open for another month. Um, and then we'll go back and, and sort of reiterate, or sort of revise the document, um, and we'll republish. And so if you can you know, access the Google Doc, put your comments in there, any suggestions, you know, we're happy to hear from the community. Uh, we do want to make this something that is uh, very inclusive and um, available for everyone. And, and you know, we may have not have got it completely right the first time, right? And so the model openness tool uh, is under development. It is going to be at isitopen.ai. Um, we expect to release this for AI dev, which is June 19th, I think, um, in Paris. Uh, and the, you know, if you want to join the Generative AI Commons, get involved and be a part of the community. We have a lot of great other initiatives that are in, in, in flight right now. We're divided into five work streams. We've got education and outreach. We've got models and data, applications, responsible AI, a lot of things uh, in frameworks, right? And so we've got these great work streams that are taking place. A lot of uh, work is being done to try and contribute back to the community. And thank you very much for joining me today. Happy to take any <coughs> questions. You ready to rate the test? Sorry? Uh, if you go to genaicommons.org, you can, there's a link right there on the onboarding presentation we have. That, that'll tell you exactly how to get involved. It's basically run through Slack and, um, and an, a mailing list. Make me run.
do you have any models that you're looking to uh, run this through to validate that you're exploring? Yeah, we're going to run it through um, every supposedly open model um, to get a real, do a real litmus test. But Eleuther AI agreed to allow us to go and evaluate all their models, and uh, RWKV agreed the same. So we'll start with their models and hopefully be able to get them to adopt the framework. Um, the big challenge, I think, is going to be that a lot of models that have been released thus far under Apache 2.0 is getting them to understand that they have to release the model weights under a, a different license. Um, it's not well understood right now, and uh, you know, on both sides of the consuming and, and uh, creation side, it's a little bit of a challenge. What's that? Yeah, yeah. And there is an, in open source, you can't have a product specific license, right? Um, and Llama 2, DBRX are all very product specific licenses. I think one of the, the challenges too is with the like got you clauses where, you know, you, not like we're going to all be, you know, having 750 million monthly users on our websites, but, um, you know, there's, uh, there are these clauses that can trigger a new license, right? And, and um, lawyers don't love that. So. Oh, I can go next, finally. Oh, yeah. Um, similar related question and kind of maybe more of an outreach question. How uh, are you planning to get existing models kind of adopted into this framework? And is there a sort of like a migration plan if they've already have like this long standing uh, way of working into sort of what generative AI commons is doing? And I guess kind of my follow up to that is maybe I'm a bit of a cynic, but I feel like as long as the model that is currently industry dominating is the highest performing, that is what people will use because it is what will make their product more money at the end of the day. And how can we either shift that mindset or begin to position ourselves in a way where we can work with that sort of mentality or like how can we also get those high performing models to where they are without feeling like we're, we're chaining them down, I guess. Yeah, so I think the, the one piece is education, right? I, I don't think that a lot of researchers understand license implications and I don't, um, if consumers demand it, it'll push us more towards open licenses. Um, it only takes one high performing model with fully open licensing to start to create a, a trend towards moving in that direction, right? And um, I would say like, so there's this challenge in, in benchmarking, right, in, in language models, which is that, uh, you know, a, a, a large language benchmark is good for about 30 days, um, after which it's already in the training data of every model. And so uh, to, you know, folks boast a lot like, oh yeah, the, this is like human eval, this is, we're right up there with Llama 2. Um, but the reality is, is that that can be engineered, right? Um, and so models are becoming less and less differentiated I think folks are trying more techniques on the training side and uh, data set side to try and improve model performance. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we haven't seen large scale enterprise adoption of these open models, right? And I think once we get a few organizations that will produce models under completely permissive licensing, that that'll just become de facto, right? So a lot of the energy is gonna be on us to to be able to encourage folks to start to move in that direction, education, and, uh, and just a little bit of encouragement. Matt, thank you so much. That was awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone.